before we come, we, before we open to the audience, um, I want to give each of the speakers two or three minutes to comment on the other one. Exactly, and then we open to the audience. And uh, Nico, you may do it first. So thank you, Clive. This was a very nice presentation. Um, I uh, was surprised because our, there are lots of similarities and there are lots of uh, insights that you gave us uh, that I agree on. But um, I also was surprised um, because the political resolution that you, uh, that you described is very well known, it is very abstract, and it, uh, it is obvious to ask uh, where is the political majority that enables a political party to enforce all these steps that you uh, described? This is one uh, <clears throat> question that I have. Uh, it is very convenient to claim such uh, political measures, but uh, it is not that uh, popular or convenient uh, to uh, describe how we are forced to live in a world that you described. So therefore, uh, I'm missing a microeconomic perspective on the, the compatibility with the lifestyles that we have to create as well. And uh, I do think that it is not possible to enforce this kind of political program because in modern uh, consumption democracies, each and every party that is in any parliament underlies a certain political code, or a kind of political system code. A political decision maker who depends on being elected has to promise more material wealth, or he perishes. The first political party that tries to enforce these measures commits political suicide. Because if you are right with your uh, thermodynamical analysis, uh, that I share completely, then there is no decoupling. And if there is no decoupling, degrowth means that there is reduction. And reduction cannot shift it or delegate it to machines or political administrations or other uh, societal subsystems. That, have, that means we have to cope with it. And so you have to explain the, pub, uh, the public how to reduce and how to live in a world where all consumption patterns and material fulfillment is reduced. And one further point, uh, you mentioned, and, and I really uh, was surprised because this is what I uh, all, also told, uh, that it is necessary to, our, to, to alter the production systems towards more labor-intensive production. But I think it would be very honest then to draw an indication, namely that our income is reduced in this case because the productivity is reduced. Also, the diversity of products is reduced in a, a non-capital intensive world. That means there are two requirements towards efficiency that are uh, preconditions for this way. And therefore, uh, this was not quite a complete picture. That we but all the other points that you are uh, described are very similar to my own analysis. The second point I think is simple. Uh, yeah, it's not worked out. Um, <laughs> I don't have a problem with what you said. I mean, you reduce the amount of stuff that's being produced, you, you're less productive, and so on. And that's exactly what we want. Uh, we want less stuff in society. So. But the, uh, there's issues I know you, you've gone into more detail. The first one, I think, is a more interesting issue, because I think your argument is actually logically flawed. Because what you're saying is that we appeal to the bottom up, the people, and the people will change the system. But if the people change the system, then you, the people are on board, and therefore the people can change the political parties. Mm -hmm. So if you believe that you can get what you want from changing people's minds, then you can get what I want, which is to change the whole system and the political parties. Mm -hmm. But I think there's, a, there's an interesting issue in there, which is the appeal to the individuals to change and how far we can do it within the structures that we have. <laughs> We've given the bombardment. I mean, I want to work within democracy but I don't think we have democracy. 
I don't think we have democracy anywhere in the world. I think what we have, what we have is a sham democracy, right? It's the rhetoric of democracy. Of course, it, it has lots of advantages for us in terms of some of the freedoms and things that we get. But a lot of the time, we don't get to say much about what goes on. Look, the, the world is structured at different levels. Local level, regional level, national level, international level, right? We have all those. Which level do you have any say in? When does your vote ever had an impact that you actually seen have a result? You know? Maybe when you do the local, it works. But at the other levels, it doesn't work. The democracy is failing us. And this is why people are so disaffected and don't vote. But it's not just that. Look at what goes on. Look at the lies we're told. Look at the hypocrisy of places like the United States and its electoral system, which has no proportional representation, where you've got to have a ton of money to get elected, where you, there's only two parties that operate. They more or less have exactly the same policies. They support a military-industrial system that exploits the third world. They have a place called Bonantanama Bay, which breaks all international rules. They're going totally unilateral. This is our best democracy, is it? And where are the other democracies? Ancient Greece, you know, with slavery and exploitation of women and, you know, I mean, where has democracy ever been on our planet? I agree we need something like democracy, but we've got to create it because we don't have it and we've never had it. I hope it's okay if I open to the audience now. Um, I want to comment on the first part. No. Sorry, there was misunderstanding. I won't find out all the basics. Okay. Um, so, I open up for questions and... Um, Why is supposed to comment on... Well, actually, there was a misunderstanding, but if we want to have time for questions, and I would like to have time for questions, we open now. And I will try to make the gender balance, because this is already not gender balanced, so it means that the questions and comments be gender balanced. Um, so, so, there was a first, there was a second, was there a second? No, no I didn't mean you, sorry. Um, okay, first. Okay, there was a second, and then I take the third over there. Okay, you first. It's quite obvious that the number of people. Can you can you stand up and speak loudly and please everybody be quiet because unfortunately we don't have a mic. And it's quite obvious that the number of people who want to see that type of change that you both are promoting is increasing. And there, there are so many projects and initiatives coming up, so that I have the impression that the number of people who would actually support such a kind of transformation is increasing. And if this number can be made visible as a political will, there would even be more people maybe could be attracted to it. So how would you see this political will, which I assume it's there, how to unite it and make it make it uh, obvious so that it can be a powerful agent of change? Okay, thanks. We are collecting. So the second one, uh, where was it? short and concise. <laughs> and the third one? Yeah, I also just want to say that, you know, when, when, you, when you get it in, in your face like this, like this uh, whole slideshow and presentation, I mean, I don't think there's almost anybody who, like in a modern world, who doesn't get it. Like, it's because of the media and the corporations, they like collude to uh, not show us all the consequences of our actions. They only show us the bright face but they never really show us what, uh, what is behind. And when you really demonstrate that to people, all these things, they know it deep down. You know, they, they know deep down all of this shit that goes on, but they just, uh, they just use to kind of uh, not look at it. But if we have some kind of political party or, or 
somehow in the media just like, you know, just that just repeats it over and over. I think most people agree that yes, it is time for change. And it cannot be fast enough. We don't have 20 or 30 years. We need to do it now as soon as possible. And I think actually a party, it would actually get a huge majority if you just really just I mean it's a myth that we're not ready for it. We are ready for it, I believe it. Okay. Thank you. Um, who wants to start? We need institutions for change. We need to be able to articulate uh, through institutions. I mean, I gave a lecture earlier today where I was talking about the failure of the institutions we have to actually empower people or to allow empowerment of people. What we have is a bunch of institutions, which I mean both government and other institutions where people engage or express their, their, themselves, which actually are there to control not to allow uh, you know, radical ideas to come through or to encourage radical ideas. So I think there's a problem in there. The extent to which, I mean, what we're doing here is what we need to do, right? What we need is solidarity, we need solidarity movements. We need to actually get people together to engage. We need this, this community to be aware of the presentation first and this, this community to go out and actually talk about it to their friends and to colleagues and other people. Because you all know 10 people, right? So there's 200 people in the room. Well, I, was, I gave up maths. <laughs> there's 2,000 people straight away, right? And then they all took to another topic. Yeah, this could actually happen through networking and so on. That's one of the hopes of the, of the movement. But of course, that's not to say that that's the only thing to be done. Of course not. I mean, strategically, you have to work on every single level. Which means, yes, you could go for national level. You can go for national parties. But it's been done in the past. Let's look at the history of this. The ecology movement in the United Kingdom, right? The Ecology Party was set up in the 1970s. It ran uh, uh, in every seat in the country. The, the system is against parties like that. It's against them because uh, the, the system in the UK, for example, is not PR. So you don't, you can get, you know, we've got 14% of the vote in, in 1989 in, in the UK, like 10 or 14 percent not one seat in Parliament, not one. Right? This is the kind of problems you have with those sort of systems. And the media and so on, I think, is, is crucial here. Like, who owns the media? Murdoch. Right? I mean, there's like one guy owning almost all of the media in the UK and loads of places in the US. I mean, the media is highly concentrated and highly controlled. I was living in Australia. Right? I thought the emissions trading scheme in Australia, I was lucky enough to have actually chosen an issue which Murdoch was against. So I got press coverage because it was convenient for them to fight it using my arguments or whatever, my case. And also to bring the government down, which is what they use, they help me and my stuff help use. If you're convenient to them, as with the corporations, they will use you. If you're not convenient, you won't get on the front page of anything, right? You won't even get one second. I've been interviewed loads of times by media in lots of countries, and I've very rarely been broadcast. Right? You could call that censorship, you can call it what you like, but it's bloody hard to get a radical message out there because the media is very, very limited and very controlled. And then you get people who you know, try to get radical messages out there, and what happens to them? They will be attacked. They will be attacked in numerous ways. Their credibility will be attacked, first of all. This is what happened to me in Australia. Then they will go for your personality. Then they will try to make out you're a bad person. Then they try to attack you in terms of your credibility about what you're, you know, where you come from and so on. And if all that fails, then maybe they'll find out that you once took a load of drugs in the 70s or something. <laughs> <laughs> right? They'll dig something up to try and discredit you. And that's what they do. Personation, personal assassination. And of course, in third world countries, they don't bother, they just kill people. Right? I mean, Brazil, you go and look at Brazil. How many people, how many activists have died in South America fighting for environmental causes? And how many people have been prosecuted for those deaths? I don't believe in conspiracy theories. There's a great uh, difference between us. I don't believe uh, that. <laughs> I don't believe that there is some kind of system that rules us. I do think that uh, you are underrating the freedom and possibilities and options that we have. Is there any person damaged that uh, who, who uh, um, uh, um, attends the degrowth conference? But it's not radical. <laughs> I mean, following, following Guy's arguments, this seems to be radical. It's just, it's just explains that Degros is radical. Um, 
I do not think that it is a matter of political intention or uh, consciousness or that it, that the matter of people who are willing to accept a degrowth process uh, matters. Because the transformation that we would need if you really want to achieve a state that is consistent with our post growth economy is completely different with everything that we ever discussed. Because modern policy is always a kind of concept of increasing possibilities. That's the reason why green growth and sustainable growth is so popular, because it's, it does not require to reduce. But transformation towards degrowth or post-growth economy makes a qualitative difference to anything that we knew about uh, modern policy uh, frameworks. Therefore, it is not necessary to accept or to intend post-growth economy. It is necessary to be able to live it. It's not a matter of articulation or communication. It's a matter of living, of social practicing and exercising this. No one springs into the pond if he or she uh, did not learn to swim. And this is the reason why we're talking about post-growth and radical claims towards political administration, but we do the opposite. So we did not uh, learn to do it. We did not learn to cope with it. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether there are millions of people who vote for post-growth. When the moment comes, and the political party tells us, let's meet, no more flying. Or you have to live 15 years with one old smartphone. In this moment, we will experience a moment of honesty. And this is a problem. And this is not a, a kind of uh, argument against democracy. But democracy, even real democracy, is not sufficient. It is necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need a change of a kind that I would name social diffusion. We need a decentralized system of platforms where people walk the talk. And this kind of communication, of materialized communication, of blueprints, these processes could alter the, the political system because then we are able to handle reduction and then we are going to vote for it. Because otherwise it would be a kind of schizophrenia. To be, to be a kerosene addict or a smartphone addict means that we are not able to question the system. First we have to learn to live with a situation that results from degrowth, then we are able to vote for a kind of political change. And therefore a post-growth party is a nice to have but I do not think that it would be successful. Think about the Green Party in Germany. 35 years ago, when they started, they were a gross critic. Uh, we have a second round of questions. I would like to ask everybody to be short and concise. Uh, please raise your hands now if you have questions. <coughs> yes, I see a lot of men. <laughs> um, okay, there's the number one, there's the number two, and I think you were first number three. No, actually it was the one in front of you. <laughs> Democracy. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, 
I don't even don't believe that there are there are some I don't know superiors who plan this and who want this. And um, of course, the people have to have to yeah live with this change we we demand. So don't you think it's it's both? Do you really think like Nico? You you say it's the people and Clem <laughs> says it's I don't know. The, I don't really get the actor. <laughs> okay, they will answer in a second. Third one? Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was amazing. Um, it inspired me like, a question. I wouldn't pose in a, an ecological economic conference, but here in a growth conference, which is kind of bridging practitioners, activists, and researchers. My question to you both is I mean, tomorrow there is a, like the proposal. To go to the carbon mine at 5 o'clock and, and block it with the sit in, like a kind of training for direct action. <laughs> Since we are in this moment of democracy, and democracy goes beyond parliamentary democracy in the parties, and as Clive says, I mean, we can influence and change people. Should, in the name of the growth, we go to, to block inside or not? I mean, is this an action that is too radical, or is now at this time? Uh, Civilization, something that is needed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the first uh, question from the first person was actually from Nico, so I won't bother uh, with that. The um, questions about the Critical legal framework that we need to change these. I mean, I think this is right. This is what I'm saying is that we operate in a system which is a multi level system. It isn't just about the individual operating in, the, uh, in the, their own place with their own practices. That's important, yes. But there are other levels of governance that go on. There are, there are institutions and structures in society which we have legal systems regional laws, international laws, we have organizations such as multinationals that do exist, that do have powers, that do not pay any attention to the individual and their practices, who will fight this, who have fought this, who I've enumerated how they've been fighting this. This is not a conspiracy theory, this is a social reality. <laughs> go and talk to the activists that work in third world, less developed countries, and I include Australia as a third world country. <laughs> <laughs> you find, yeah, I'm sorry, but some of my Australian friends would agree. This is an extractivist economy run by the mining industry. What for? Do they care if somebody who's a, an activist dies in the desert, their cars happen to fall, the wheels fall off their car or something, you know, whatever? No, of course not. It's very convenient. And you go look at, I mean, Chico Mendes is obviously very famous, but there's loads of other people who have been killed, you know, in, in South America for trying to oppose things. This is not conspiracy. This is not some this central, not this is not so, Germany. and you don't think there's a military and an intelligence service in this country that is very concerned about the security of Germany, and that isn't prepared to secure its resource base. Where do you think all these rare metals that are in all these phones come from? Who is cooperating here? Who supports the United States? Right? I mean, this is the world. This is the world military industrial complex. It's not a conspiracy, it's a reality. This is what we've created in our Why? Go to the airport. What are the security services doing to you? They can do anything they like to you if you've got the wrong go to pointed. <laughs> So it's not about people like the multinational corporations and the way they're structured. It's that the people who live inside those corporations and work inside those corporations have a belief system which they are perpetuating, right? They think they're doing a good job. They think that they're doing good things for the world. They're That's actually why they don't kill people. 
Yeah, but they, they are associated with the military industrial complex, which does kill people. Yeah, Look, you just had a resource oh, war over oil. We've had two resource wars over oil. In, you know, what, do you, what do you think goes on in Iran and Iraq? Do you think people weren't killed? But what for? Because they were worried about ma weapons of mass destruction that didn't even exist. And the weapons of mass destruction are in the United States and Europe, with nuclear weapons, and the Soviet Union. They weren't in Iran and Iraq. Oil was in Iran and Iraq. It was an oil war. People died for, those, for that petrol so that people could have cars in Germany, which has a car industry. <laughs> Civil action. civil action is important. Yes, we should undertake civil action. And it's down to the conscience of every individual to decide whether they undertake it. So I won't say to you, go and do it. I would leave to your conscience as to whether you do it. And I think it but is time... But you scare off people if you say they are... They, they risk their lives. So that's why I wouldn't um, recommend... They're not risking their lives if they go on civil action. Yeah. You might get beaten up by the police, but... Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you for the... Yeah. Okay, I don't fly and I do not risk my life. Even the opposite is true. I'm very healthy. I don't use a smartphone, I don't eat meat, I don't drive an SUV, and I don't hate women, and I do not risk my life. So, uh, and I, don't get me wrong, I either do not accept the industrial military complex. The only thing I say is, it is not possible to overcome this without changing our lifestyle because our dependence on certain supply is the reason for the existence and the persistence of these structures. This, that's all what I wanted to say. And I also wanted not to say that it is our that it is nonsense to vote or that it is nonsense to take political action. What I'm trying to explain is that before political action can really matter, we have to meet a certain challenge, a precondition. We must change our life. If we do not walk the talk, we are not honest in the political process. No matter whether it is a real or a not real democracy, you are right. I agree that the system we live in is not a real democracy. But despite of this fact, I do have lots of action in Germany without risking my life. And I think we should uh, use this potential. Uh, legal framework, it's the same, uh, it's the same um, problem. I like frameworks that are compatible with sustainability or even with post-growth economics. But once again, we are not able to achieve a majority that enforces the political process to establish these rules or frameworks because we are, sorry for repeating myself, uh, I repeat myself when I'm under stress, I repeat myself when I'm under stress. <laughs> right. So, um, this framework is a very, very hard task to live with. And we are not used to live this way. So many people, even in the degrowth movement, are flying all the way. My parents didn't fly. I don't fly. So, there is a kind of... Uh, kind of pretending that we are able to have a different system. And the last question, of course civil action, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, actually that's it because we are already almost caught in an hour over the time. Nick has come up to me several times and I've never had a chance to come back on it. I give you one minute. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to clarify that I, I don't believe that everybody at this degrowth conference is going to be killed by the CIA. <laughs> so, it's not like that. You don't risk your life. And I don't want to get into this, my brother is bigger than your brother, I'm purer than you kind of stuff, right? I mean, look, all the things that you said that you don't do, I don't do as well. Right? I don't have TV and all this kind of stuff. But I'm not going to say, I'm doing I think you're grown ups. So, look, look, I agree with you. We do need to take action and we need to set examples for people by taking action. 
And I think that's very important that we do that. But at the same time, we cannot ignore the structure of society and the barriers there are in society and what goes on in society and pretend that just by me not flying, me not being, being a vegetarian, me not having a TV, me not having a mobile phone, all the things which I do, for the same reasons you do, that we are just going to not change, that the world is going to change overnight. Okay, sorry. I did not, I did not assert that I can save the world by not flying. You see, it is a precondition that we all are able to live with not flying, that the policy can take action of yeah. abolishing uh, airports or having a kerosene tax. This is what I said. Okay? Yeah.